Our uh, next speaker will be uh, uh, two uh, uh, non two persons. Uh, it's debate at uh, diagnosis of uh, neonatal cholestasis biopsy phase uh, gene testing. The first uh, one will be Dr. Khalid Al Salim uh, from Riyadh, uh, pediatric gastroenterologist. Welcome, Dr. Khalid. Uh, Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, in the era of the genetic diagnosis, people now shifting and trying to ignore liver biopsy and the role of liver biopsy in neonatal cholestasis diagnosis. So my talk is trying to convince you that liver biopsy is here to stay, and even with the era of genetic diagnosis, we still have to have a lot of role of liver biopsy in neonatal diagnosis. This is the outline of my talk, and I will try to debate the safety, the cost, and some limitation of the genetic test during my talk. First of all, if we go back to the history of liver biopsy, it is actually reported almost more than 150 years ago. And with the introduction of the Mangini needles, it's become almost relevant in the 50 years and it's widely applicable in the clinical practice by any pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist. We know that the histological assessment of the liver is the cornerstone in evaluating the liver disease of patient and the percutaneous liver biopsy, it is very safe, time efficient, and this actually can be done even in the smallest kids. On the other side, we know that in the era of the geno uh, genometric analysis, that we are having more competitive diagnostic tool. Rather than ignoring the liver biopsy, we should look in the opportunities. And with the genetics diagnosis, there is a now emerging opportunities, permitting us in the liver biopsy by, up, by applying the immunohistochemical stain even to detect those gene, test, uh, gene disorder and biochemical disorder. If we come now to the neonatal cholestasis, we know it is common and we are seeing it a lot. And almost 10 disease account for more than 95% of the cases. And again, we should not to forget biliary atresia. It's one of the most common. It's a, a count almost 30% of patients with the neonatal cholestasis and by far the most frequent cause of liver transplant worldwide. I know we have more genetic disorder in our area, but worldwide it is the most common disorder for liver transplant. Biliary atresia is not genetic disease. It is multifactorial. We didn't have a gene for it and represent quarter of the cases. Even imaging study is not specific for that one. And if we come to the liver biopsy for biliary atresia, it is very, very sensitive. And actually it is up to 95% we can have sensitivity in, uh, in the hand of expert pathologist. If we come to the guideline, and the NAS began, S began, and the role of liver biopsy. Actually, the interpretation by the expert pathologist will provide a correct diagnosis up to 95%. So the limitation of liver biopsy comes if you didn't have the resource or you didn't have an expert pathologist. And if we come to the joint NAS began, S began guideline of rolling of liver biopsy in cholestatic jaundice, and this is just published recently one year ago, that the liver biopsy is the most supportive test in the evaluation of infant with liver disease. Keep always this in your mind, and always when you do any practice, go with the established guideline. On the other hand, are we doing the liver biopsy to make a diagnosis? Actually, the role of liver biopsy, it is not only diagnostic, the only way to assess the liver and the disease progression 
and the degree of inflammation and the stage of fibrosis is by liver biopsy. And most of the imaging technique which we have like restorography, hyperscan, I mean to be done in an infant, we didn't have a good really data to support that. And also the liver biopsy have some therapeutic implication. And if we come to this position paper published by the ASLD, we can see that the diagnosis is limited and we are using, it is jumping here, we are using it a lot for staging, prognostic, and management, even if we have the diagnosis by simple test. So keep in your mind that the liver biopsy it is not only for diagnosis. Is it safe? Always people scare us that the liver biopsy is not safe. Is this is true? Actually, it is well-known technique. If you choose the right patient and the right technique in obtaining the biopsy, and we have a lot of way obtaining it, the safety profile is very, very high. And if we come for the mortality risk, in adults, the liver biopsy have mortality risk of one in 10,000, and believe it or not, to die from road traffic accident in Saudi Arabia, you will have 2.5% per 10,000 per year. So it's almost double the risk of liver biopsy. So it is safe in the right hand, in right circumstance. Is it costly? A lot of investigation tools cost and have significant cost. However, as a physician, we should realize that the cost comes from a lot of waste. If we decrease the waste, we will decrease the cost. And it is simple to decrease the waste. If you select the right patient, if you decrease the complication and select the right approach, I am sure the cost of liver biopsy will decrease. Genetic testing, Dr. Ali, he will cover it and he will try to convince you that the genetic test is the best and I'm trying to say no. Because genetic test, even if it's giving the diagnosis, it will not predict the severity of the disease, the penetrance of the genetic test and the expression of that disease in the liver, it is variable from one disease to another. And the only way to know that is this disease affecting the liver severely is by obtaining and doing liver biopsy. Lab error is always there, but it's, it can occur. Genetic test, and I'm sure most of you getting back the result of genetic test. Some of them, it's not straightforward. And it's really the interpretation of those gene tests is not simple. Sometimes it's confusing. And I'm sure you will get some result, even of whole exome, and make you wonder what I am having, which disease I am having. The cost, and it's decreasing, we know, but the availability of this test is not always there in any center. So the conclusion of my talk that the diagnosis of most liver disease in children require histopathological confirmation, percutaneous liver biopsy is safe and to provide histopathological examination and assessment of the disease, and it will remain the cornerstone of assessing parenchymal liver disease. And we know now that with reducing cost of the genetic testing, it's emerging and Genetic tests, it will facilitate the diagnosis. However, it's important to realize that the meaning of genetic mutation, it's depend always in clinical context and your clinical assessment rather than the gene result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. And now welcoming Dr. Raad Ali Al-Mayadib from King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Ali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid, for this uh, excellent presentation. I think you convinced me to go for liver biopsy. <laughs> uh, let me start with the first slide. Uh, uh, I thought, you know, liver biopsy was the traditional and conventional way of diagnosing uh, children with liver disease. But 
not every single patient who comes with liver disease needs a liver biopsy. And this is the difference. So I must say, do not do liver biopsy in every single patient. Why? These are the complication of liver biopsy. Huge list of complication. And patients die because of this simple procedure. Although Dr. Khal mentioned it is one in 1,000 or 10,000, it is not easy to lose a child with just a procedure after a procedure. And we have many publications in different countries where they have shown that the mortality is still there. So patients are dying. They have an incidence like 6.8% of overall complication, 2.4% of major complication, and 0.4% of death. So I think we need to ask ourselves, why do we need to send patient to a liver biopsy when there is such a risk? This is another study, mortality rate, this is from Iran, is 0.5%, so we lose five children in every 10,000, you know, uh, biopsies. Another study, three deaths from Australia, and two patients required transfer to the ICU for related complication. What is the cost of ICU admission? And the conventional way of doing liver biopsy is doing a percutaneous liver biopsy. Some people, they say, no, let us do laparoscopic biopsy. It's easy. This is, uh, this is another study which has major complication but no death. However, another biopsy, another, you know, percutaneous biopsies with 1.7% uh, uh, you know, of major complications. And this is, you know, a study of almost 2,700, you know, patients who went for many laparoscopies and two patients died after severe hemorrhage with a mortality rate of 0.07%. So even percutaneous biopsy, laparoscopic biopsy, and the other type of biopsy is transphenous biopsy in, in, in risky patients. So we do some patients, we send them for transphenous biopsy. Fortunately, in our center, we have no death, but you know, in this study, the mortality rate was 0.09%, hemorrhage and ventricular arrhythmia. So this is not simple. We don't want to lose, we are, you know, we enter the hospital every day to cure patients and send them back home. We don't want to send them to the graveyard. Let us see, you know, the, the histologic features. This is a study uh, uh, of 86 infants with neonatal cholestasis. As you see in the group three, 50 out of 86, the diagnosis was idiopathic. So what did we get? 60% of these patients has no diagnosis after liver biopsy, while 40% has a diagnosis. So it is risky. It does not always tell us the diagnosis. So the genetic testing has revolutionized the analysis of human genetic variations offering a highly cost-effective way to diagnose monogenic diseases. And uh, it was mentioned earlier, nearly half of children with chronic liver disease have a genetic cause, and approximately 20% of pediatric liver transplant are performed in children with monogenic diseases. So genetic testing offers the opportunity to significantly improve the diagnostic yield in this field. In pediatric hepatology, targeted Gene testing can be very valuable to discriminate neonatal cholestatic disorder, to disclose genetic causes of acute liver failure, and to diagnose the subtype of inborn error of metabolism presenting with a similar phenotype. The most important you know, question raised by our colleagues in the transplant uh, hepatology is they say, oh, this could be a mitochondrial disorder. Let us do a biopsy. So if it is a mitochondrial disorder, no need to send them for transplant. It is contraindicated. And the inclusion of genetic testing in the diagnosis will lead to a paradigm shift in medicine, changing our approach to the patients as well as our understanding of factors affecting genotype-phenotype match.
This is a study published in 1997 by Professor Asad Asiri, where you know, the idiopathic causes were almost 50%. I think these patients were a genetic diseases, which was not recognized at that time. Biliary atresia causes 26%. And these patients who have biliary atresia, yes, they need a liver biopsy. Dr. Idris in 2003, he reported, he presented, you know, his experience again. You know, we are seeing more metabolic, more genetic disorder compared to 1997, and the idiopathic only 11%. And in another set of patients, we reviewed 120 patients. We have seen, you know, that genetic diseases are predominant. 20% uh, uh, of these patients has biliary atresia. 35% is BIFIC, and metabolic is 25%. So we are seeing a majority of patients in our society as you compared to the, you know, to the West. So what is the common indication for liver transplantation in our country? It is not biliary atresia. And this is, was published by our colleagues early in military hospital. And BFIC is equal to biliary atresia. But we have other list of genetic diseases uh, leading to uh, liver transplantation. This is just outside of hepatology. This is neurology or ophthalmology. So in this you know, paper, they have patient have different diagnosis clinically, and when they do gene testing, they have another diagnosis, although they are similar. So, and it is the same story in, 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 in pediatric gastroenterology, hepatology. We, uh, you know, this paper, you know, concentrate on diagnosing allergial syndrome based on genetic testing, although these patients presented with one or two clinical features of allergial syndrome. So based on clinical presentation or even histology, the diagnosis of allergial syndrome was not confirmed. So the genetic testing has confirmed the diagnosis. Furthermore, we have this experience also. Patients were diagnosed as Wilson disease, and with genetic testing, they are progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, type three. A waste of you know, treatment, complication of drugs, et cetera, et cetera. This is another also study with the same concept. There was overlap between Wilson disease and progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. So this paper, the comment that, you know, multi-gene panel is a fast and comprehensive tool to diagnose inherited pediatric hepatopathies. In uh, a recent study published uh, by Dr. al Kraya and his colleagues, and many of you maybe were, are part of this study, they have discovered different patients who was diagnosed with different diagnosis for a long time, but they came to be another diagnosis. This is a patient who was followed with no diagnosis and considered for liver transplant. He had polycystic liver disease, although on ultrasound and MRI, there was no cyst identified. It is caused by autosomal dominant, you know, uh, polycystic kidney disease. And this patient was, it was very helpful in selecting an unaffected donor from his relatives because this is an autosomal dominant disease. They may get, you know, a, a donor who is affected with the same disease. Uh, another patient who was you know, treated as Crohn's disease for some time and she had adhesion molecule deficiency. Uh, so genetic testing is very beneficial. A third patient, also a patient who has Barter syndrome, and uh, you know, he went for transplantation and he is discovered to have congenital chloride diarrhea. So not always, you know, when you depend on your clinical you know, uh, uh, you know, diagnosis with the assistance of histology or assistance of radiology or whatever, you will have the right diagnosis. So let me conclude. Liver biopsy is not always a consideration in every single patient. It will be considered if you are looking for structural anomalies, biliary atresia, colidocal cyst, if you have infection or metabolic disease which can be detected other than liver biopsy. So don't consider it if, if, if every single patient, but 
I'm strongly, you know, supportive of genetic testing in the diagnosis of neonatal cholestasis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mehedip. And I thank all the speakers for sticking to their time and their informative lectures. And like all the speakers to come to the stage for opening the questions and discussion. Any question from the audience? I have a question to Dr. Awafa. Uh, why the metabolic liver disease patients doing better in survival than non-metabolic liver disease after liver transplant? Yeah, the question was why patients with metabolic liver disease do better in survival. Uh, you know, these patients are, are healthy patients. They are okay. They don't have toxic, uh, toxic uh, look or uh, the, uh, the, um, yeah, the disturbances that a patient with cirrhosis has. So when they go for liver transplantation, they are better. They have less complications and they have better survival. That's, that's uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, found in these patients. So they do better. I don't know whether you have another cause uh, I really think that these patients don't have portal hypertension, don't have previous surgery. Then these are the two most difficult things at the time of the surgery, the, uh, the surgery, the technical difficulties of operating on patients that have previous surgeries, like a patient with biliary atresia, that have previous CASI, patient with portal hypertension, low platelet and coagulopathy. Then if you compare a patient with a metabolic disorder that comes to the OR uh, with a virgin abdomen, no portal hypertension, normal platelet count, is the life and death um, different. Any questions from audience? Hey, you. <coughs> I have a question, Mosama. I have a question to the Dr. Shabab. Okay, okay. 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 Okay, it's good to, to listen to a talk. But I really enjoyed the debate. I really enjoyed what the Dr. Khalil and Dr. Ali uh, presented. I think this is a new thing, new sort of uh, way. I'd like to, to see more of this debate. It's, it's very good. Nicely presented by both of, of, of you, Dr. Khalid and Dr. Ali. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it was presented in a very nice way, eloquent way. But um, in my opinion, recently I went with a, a relative to a physician. And this relative is complaining of something related to the heart. The physician, already there is a, 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 an ECG came to him um, and the blood pressure. He did not touch the patient. Sent the patient to MRI, C, CT, uh, uh, heart, and uh, you know, echo, and came to the conclusion, prescribed the medication. I really think that we are moving away from a patient. I feel, I feel if this doctor just put his stethoscope, we'd be, even if he didn't hear anything abnormal, still the patient will feel something. What I mean, we seem to be going away from relating to the patient to relating to, you know, investigation. I think we're treating more investigation. Uh, your point is well taken, Dr. Ali. There is mortality and so forth, but how, have you, I've never seen, you've never seen. True, research is there, but I think it's still a safe thing. And I think, although the genetic will diagnose, still yet, a biopsy will tell me what this patient, what's going inside the patient. I think 
this is what I, I think we should relate more to the patient, get more inside the patient, see what the patient has. This is my opinion. So I am sorry, Dr. Ali. I am trying to incline a little bit, Khalid. But I mean, but what you said is not bad, yeah. I mean, but Dr. Khalid, I I I go with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Abdul Wahab. I think this is a very healthy discussion because we brought this debate for the first time, and uh, our meeting here is just not to come and listen to people presenting and belief. So we need to have something, you know, controversial. And uh, as everybody you knows, we work in the same hospital, and we have the same debate every day. Uh, in my experience, uh, you know, uh, nowadays we d I don't do endoscopies and intestinal biopsies for congenital, you know, diarrhea, so enteropathy. I go ahead and do the gene because most of the time, if you don't have an experienced pathologist, you will have non-specific findings. And this is the question. I'm sure, you know, we are seeing one to two patients per week with neonatal cholestasis. And biopsies do not give us an answer. You know, just could be this, could be for clinical correlation. I think the debate where Dr. Khalid and some of my colleagues, you know, are, are stressing is that the time is very important. Because when you do genetic testing, it, it takes time. So they prefer to do a liver biopsy early before the you know, coagulation you know, uh, get worse, before they develop thrombocytopenia, high risk for to do a liver biopsy. So it will give us a clue to the future while we are awaiting the, the, the genetic testing. However, I think with time, we will have shorter you know, uh, period to receive the result of genetic testing. We'll have more experience at least in, in our hospital. And uh, this will save you know, a lot of money. Even the cost, I, I, there was a slide that did not appear. The cost is comparable because you need to do ultrasound, uh, DTBTT, CBC, admit patient to DMU, the day surgery or to inpatient. You need a pathologist who will need it, et cetera, et cetera. So it is not you know, cheap to do a liver biopsy. It is almost the same as, as doing a genetic testing. So this is, I think, this is how the, you know, medicine develops. You know, what we used to do five years ago is not now the routine. We need to think of something more patient-related or safety-related rather than just doing the conventional things which was done in the past. Dr. Hussain. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, uh, first uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the excellent uh, uh, lectures. Really, I enjoyed them. Um, uh, first, in regard to the classification of infantile cholestasis, I think we have still a problem in classifying you know, the metabolic, genetic, uh, uh, um, uh, some other uh, diseases. Uh, I think uh, you know, even this classification is still in the textbook of, of uh, hepatology. Still, there is a problem in Sometimes you find, for in example, including alpha-1 antitrypsin among the metabolic, sometimes you find it under, under genetic. Uh, and I think it's important to standardize the, the classification because most of the list that you, Dr. Uh, Wafa, you um, listed for those who underwent liver transplantation and classified under metabolic liver disease, I don't think they are, although came from uh, any, uh, any excellent center, but still I have some question about them. For example, including alpha-1 antitrypsin or uh, cystic fibrosis under, under metabolic, um, I think um, I think very good to standardize the classification. Uh, in regard to the uh, debate, um, um, in our center, King Fahim Medical City, we are not a liver transplant center. So I think the, the cases that are referred to us, and I think it is more representative of the Saudi Arabia more than the liver transplant centers because the liver transplanters, they tend to receive the more severe cases. So that's why I think there is over-representation of biliary atresia in your, uh, in your case series. Uh, but in your case series, even in the military hospital, it is 20, 25 percent. 
I think in we in over the past 10 years, we accumulated around 600 cases of neonatal cholestasis. And we collected the data and uh, almost analyzing them. Uh, BLRT is only represented 4.5%. So it's very uncommon. Um, uh, there are several other, what you think it's rare, it's more common than biliary atresia. So if we think now retrospectively about the, the role of liver biopsy, only just, in, uh, and I see that liver biopsy, the big role now over the time, we are, if we, we reviewed our liver biopsy record, we find it very diminishing, declining only toward when we think of uh, uh, biliary atresia, which is only 4.5%. Um, the most important before even considering liver biopsy or gene test, considering very simple uh, screening test that can be helpful to guide further management. Uh, simple test, blood test sometimes uh, very helpful. For example, doing serum bile acid, doing lactate, um, um, uh, the, the, the GGT, high, low GGT, all these will guide really the, the further investigations rather than jumping to doing, for example, whole exome sequence or doing like a, a cholestasis panel. Sometimes just, for example, finding persistently high lactate. This will direct you more toward investigation for mitochondrial disease. So I think in the era of now even, you know, cost saving, uh, it's very important to personalize the investigation and approach to infantile cholestasis toward the history, physical examination, and toward sample test uh, that can di direct us for further investigations. But I agree, a child with high GGT, pale stool, I think we should prompt immediately to do a, a liver biopsy. In other conditions, I did not find really liver biopsy very helpful. So I tend really to lean toward Dr. Ali's uh, viewpoint that uh, we need to need really restrict doing liver biopsy only in very, very few selected cases. Among them is biliary atresia cases. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I think it's a comment rather than a question, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Dr. Shamran. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank everybody also, the one who presented. I'm interested so much. But again, to Dr. Mahid and Dr. Khaled, I would like to say that not everybody is working at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Not everybody is having the ultrasound guided biopsy. Uh, the question is coming like this. As if that we have been a little bit scared that we have to do to go for the liver biopsy because of the complication that has been mentioned. Now, when I just been moved from the south to King Abdullah Medical City Maternity and Children's Hospital, they were doing the liver biopsy uh, uh, ultrasound guided. And what did they, what do they get? They used to get only the capsule or something below beyond the capsule and just only one one biopsy, one core biopsy. That it's helpless. So what did we, we have? Coming back again to the percutaneous liver biopsy, we did about 10 cases. We have no problems. Now, Dr. Khaled, have you gone through the ultrasound? You did not mention anything regarding the ultrasound guided biopsy related to the percutaneous. Is something to say is contraindicated to do like this one or something has to become over, over the other thing? We just been privileged for this and that's it. We get a lot of biopsies, the good core. You could see it has to pathologically. And that's it. We know it's working. Yeah. We know the limitation of liver biopsy. And it's depending on your center and your resource. If you have an expert pathologist and interventional radiologist who is really good in doing that, you will obtain a good sample. Again, I mean the the problem with now genetic testing. We should individualize for sure our investigation and certain patients they didn't require liver biopsy if in the clinical or there is high index of suspicion or there is a clear metabolic disorder in your screen test it doesn't make sense at all but the only things I mean I'm worried that the genetic chip test become almost the routine so everyone will send it for screen and then at the end maybe the time will tell us if we are missing more biliary atresia and 10 years from now because of the implication of this genetic testing. We don't know. But it's look like the trend is going for that now. To clarify, you know, this is, you know, once we see a patient just admitted, we never go do genetic testing or do liver biopsy. No, we, we do the routine work. 
And we, we do a urine testing, we do some blood tests to rule out other galactosemia, tyrosinemia. We don't need, you know, liver biopsy, we don't need sometimes, you know, genetic analysis. We go to do, you know, genetic counseling or genetic diagnosis or whatever. This is another story. But, you know, we usually do the basic workup and the simple thing, urine analysis you know, and culture. We have seen patients with the UTI coming with cholestasis, and once we treat them, cholestasis resolves. So this biopsy versus genetic testing is meant for patients who have been worked up initially, and there is no clear diagnosis. I just want to make a comment, and I think that you are totally right. Um, you do the biopsy, you get a good tissue, otherwise don't do it. Um, we do deliver biopsies without ultrasound guidance in these small babies and are more likely to do two passes in a two month old than I like to do two passes in a 14 year old. Because you have to go small, but you need to get a bigger piece of tissue to do um, the diagnosis of rejection. You need one centimeter, you don't need more. For a biliary atresia, you might need two centimeters. That is very difficult to get with one pass sometimes. You send these babies to the interventional radiologist. They don't want to see them. You need to be there and tell them, get more. Uh, but I give you a piece, no, I need more. Uh, and you, as a doctor, are the only one that really know what you make the decision to put this baby under anesthesia to get this procedure. You need to get a, a good core. Otherwise, it's useless. And we see that when the patients come with a liver biopsy from another center, half a centimeter. Nobody can make a diagnosis with that. And I think that this is when you do the liver biopsy, send a good core, send a good I, We do well. So. Uh, last questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for all the speakers. Uh, this is good. Can I say in the talk of Dr. Ali and Dr. Khaled, it's a classic talking uh, by the liver biopsy and genetic. By the way, I'm postgraduate from the same place as the King Faisal Special Hospital. Um, the problem, um, the, the, the liver biopsy, is the question for Dr. Ali. Um, this is histopathological dependent. Sometimes, I, I can do the liver biopsy, but I can't get the diagnosis because the histopathological, um, uh, or histopathologist is not expert with the pediatric age. And we'll have a dilemma in this case, then I will uh, I, I move from the histopathology to the genetic. Um, in this, um, 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 the, uh, how can I, I do for the patient? I need, um, for me, I, um, um, genetic test is the best for uh, the uh, optional for my patient in my center. Um, but sometime I need to do the liver biopsy for some uh, cer or the certain reason to get the di other diagnosis. If I have the negative genetic uh, diagnosis, or sometimes it is a challenging case. Um, what's your uh, opinion and exper expert opinion about the uh, liver biopsy in this situation, like my st situation in Berifri Hospital? Second, uh, second question for Dr. Khaled, at the same time, is opposite. Can I, in genetic, yes, I um, uh, agree for the genetic, but in, uh, disagree, um, um, to a move of the genetic from our uh, work up in some cases. Um, if I have the uh, genetic is um, diagnosis, take time, yes, and now is less cost. I can do it in the, nowadays what I know is uh, the Saudi Diagnostic Lab is the one of the branch of King Faisal Special Hospital Riyadh. This is a private, but can do in the less cost. Is, um, I didn't know about the, uh, what I know is, is high standard. Um, is genetic for me is easy. What do you think of the, I can avoid the liver biopsy? <laughs> okay. For genetic test, as I just explained in my slide, knowing the diagnosis it doesn't indicate what's going on. So the liver biopsy, it will, most of those genetic disorder, even if they have the gene and they are labeled, we didn't know what's the exact impact in the liver. We know from the historical data, certain gene testing will known to have this association, 
But again, I mean, even if the patient listed for a transplant, they want to see if there is advanced cirrhosis in this patient. So from my point of view, liver biopsy is almost a must in certain condition, especially if the patient's going for liver transplant. For there is, you know, no genetic uh, testing uh, infallibility. And I think you may need to go with liver biopsy. Still, liver biopsy is, you know, very important in evaluation patient with neonatal cholestasis. But it depends where do you work. The question, I think, the only uh, reservation from my side is the time when we do the test and we get the result. So this take minimum of three months, sometimes six months. So uh, I think, you know, now in our hospital, they will have, uh, you know, like express service for very sick infants. In the ICU, they will do them within one week. They will do whole exome sequencing. But these patients need to be sick. They are in the ICU. So we need to make a decision, a quick decision on them, especially those who have neonatal liver failure and so on. But in general, if you don't have access to genetic testing, you just you go to do a, you know, a liver biopsy. And most of the time, you don't have an expert, you know, pathologist. You may send it to, to uh, somebody who's expert. Uh, we have some pathologists. Uh, I am sure in King Fahad University, we lost uh, our ex-pathologist. He's one of the best pathologists. I think we stop here. Uh, I have one question only. You have a question? question? Okay, the last. Last okay. question. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Tariq, working in uh, 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 Neonatal Intensive Care Unit in uh, MCH uh, Breda. Uh, we are dealing with uh, premature babies, uh, extreme low birth weight and uh, very low birth weight, less than 1 kg, less than 1.5 kg. We are facing problem, sometimes uh, conjugated hyperplurbemia. And I have one patient, he remained uh, was high uh, conjugated hyperplurbemia for more than t uh, two months. And finally, uh, after we did uh, ultrasound, high the scan, everything came normal without any inter intervention. So for, for, for me as a neonatologist, uh, what things that I can do uh, to uh, be calm that this patient no, don't need further evaluation? Uh, yani how I can know that is a genuine uh, liver problem or is this secondary to uh, TPN or uh, secondary to sepsis? And uh, it is, will take a long time to normalize the uh, conjugated hyperbolemia if it is related to TPN or related to sepsis. Okay, then um, this is a question that I think that we have in every single neonatal ICU. Um, I think that was part of um, one of the things that I, when I presented yesterday, most neonates will develop cholestasis. If they are complex, if they, are, if they have sepsis, if they have heart disease, they are cholestatic. Which one of these babies have cholestasis because it's multifactorial, or which one have cholestasis because of liver disease? And this is a, sometimes very difficult to tease out. I think that um, you need to see the patient as a whole, and I agree with the doctor that I spoke at the very beginning. We need to see the patient. We cannot just look at the bilirubin. We cannot just look at the um, ultrasound. I think, and, if, and you are an experienced neonatologist, you can say this baby is behaving different. This cholestasis is out of proportion with the clinical presentation. Then that patient definitely need further evaluation. And the evaluation will be determined of which direction. Very unlikely that premature babies have biliary atresia. We have few cases. Um, the other question that you are going to say, if I do a liver biopsy in this baby, what am I going to do with the restores? The liver biopsy come back and said the baby might have biliary atresia. Then will my surgeons do a cast eye on this patient? And, and this is the question. Then this is when you bring the surgeons, the neonatologists and the hepatologists in the same room, and then if I, as a pathologist, give you a liver biopsy, and I give you a diagnosis that this patient might have biliary atresia, what are we going to do with this diagnosis? And we bring the parents into the room. These are difficult cases that take a lot of time, a lot of manpower, but this is the only way that you are going to take care of this patient. That decision cannot be made by you, needs to be made by a multidisciplinary team looking at the patient and the patient as a whole. Know what is the bilirubin, know what is the high scan. Don't look at just the results of the test. Look at the patient 
and you need to make a decision. And sometimes um, it's very difficult. There was one case, and this is kind of a baby in the NICU with a cardiac condition and a cholestasis out of proportion. And then they forced us to do a, a, a liver biopsy, a two kilo baby with a cardiac problem. We did the liver biopsy, come back suggested of biliary atresia. The surgeon didn't want to say, now it's on your, you know, now if you don't do the intraocular angiogram, it's in. and we have sent the whole exome sequence that uh, this is about a year and a half ago, it took about two months to come back. The surgeon goes to the OR, according to him, the patient has biliary atresia, did the CASI, guess what? The whole exome sequence didn't come back, and then the patient has allergies. Um, but then and now we have three patients now that have a CASI and allergies. Then this is kind of an overlap thing that is going on now. We don't know. Then how many patients in the, in the past have a CASI that may have biliary, uh, diagnosed with biliary atresia and also have allergies? We didn't do the genetic testing in the past very often. Then now we are learning more and more, and then what are we going to, to do with this? Then now uh, we need to treat this patient as allergies, and we need to go for the kidneys, the eye, the neuro exam, and this is the only benefit, and the two babies actually require a transplant. Then it's very difficult. Don't, it doesn't get easier anywhere that you go, but these are maybe the more complex patients that you uh, need to take care of. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we can stop here, and we'll have a break for uh, 15 minutes. Okay.